Amen. Well, it is great to be here today. I'm in a good mood. How about you? You in a pretty good mood? Oh, don't all of a sudden die on me. We got to move around or something? Stand up, take a deep breath, go outside, come back in. I don't know. Come on. All right. So I just want to, first of all, again, thank you for, for coming here. And, uh, and, and I know some of you are going to really enjoy what I'm about to say. We're at week nine, week nine of ten weeks on Financial Peace University, right? How's that sound to you? Good? Oh, I'm preaching to the choir, aren't I? You guys would be here anyway. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm loving it. And again, I want to say there's, there's just a lot of uh, deep research and, and uh, studying God's Word that, that I've done, I've never done before um, regarding stewardship, especially the, uh, the stewardship of, of money, of finances and all that. I've, I've learned a ton. And I was just talking to the Bible study group. I said, you know what I've learned more than anything else is that not only does Jesus talk more about money than anything else, and so does God himself, but when you look back at all the different events in the Bible that went wrong, almost every one of them had to do with money. <laughs> they had to do some way, somehow, with, with, with power and money mixed together. And uh, just a good lesson for us. So I'm going to tell you that though I only have two weeks left of FPU, I'm going to preach about money the rest of my life. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so, don't worry about it. Anyway, this is week nine, and uh, our series is called Defying Gravity, a life uh, debt-free. And I want to uh, emphasize again that um, what that means is there's a supernatural pull on us, and that's from Satan himself, the prince of the world. We're using as a metaphor the gravitational pull. It just happens because the world is who the world is. And what Satan does is he uses, he tempts us with what we want, and that's materialism, material stuff, because the more material stuff we want and demand to get, the more money we spend and the more in debt we get, and that's what he wants, because that causes anxiety, that handcuffs us and keeps us from, from living and giving to others in need because we're fulfilling our own wants, and it pulls us away from God in a lot of areas in our lives. And it's a part of discipleship that Satan does not want um, um, uh, Christians to learn. And so what I, my job, I, I feel these past nine weeks so far have been to take the principles that are taught, the temporal principles of financial management, and apply them to our spiritual lives so that we, we, we get the, the whole look, the whole view. Um, it's not just dealing with a temporal issue. This is spiritual. It all comes together. And so we've had messages that have talked about personal discipline and how, yeah, it looks like it's only a life thing here to have discipline, but actually we get that discipline from God himself. We've talked about how the management of being a steward in our lives of any gift that God has given us is really an issue of the heart, and that's a heart that only God can change. We've also talked about how when we start applying the biblical principles, especially of finances in our lives, you're going to get attacked. There's spiritual warfare that's going on, and we've seen that in this church, and I know some of you have seen that in your own personal lives. And as I talked about last week, it's because we are disciples of Jesus, and we are called by God to invest in futures, the future eternal lives of others. Satan does not like that. So today's message, though, you can probably guess a little bit of it based on some of the songs we've been singing, is called Home Sweet Home. Home sweet home. In Lesson 8 in Financial Peace, how many of you had Lesson 8, went to Lesson 8 for Financial Peace University? Okay, a number of you here, good. Um, Dave Ramsey talks a lot about home and the importance of home, how it's really everybody's dream to have a home, to have a home you can call your own, a home where you can hang your hat, a home that, that, that's just yours, you know? And, and that's why of all the debt, he says you got to get rid of, the last piece of debt you get rid of is your mortgage. And even if you still got a mortgage, that's okay, but once you get everything else snowballed off, then you start going after the mortgage too, because no debt is, is great to have. He wants us, though, eventually, to know and love our home. And it's a whole lot easier to love it when we're not paying for it. <laughs> Some of you I know know that. I don't know that yet. <laughs> I hope to learn that in the next few years. But to help make my, my point this, this morning... Um, about the importance of a home, I kind of want to do something different this morning. Uh, I want to take you on a journey. It's a, it, it's a journey of my life, and I want you to see my life through my eyes. I'm going to share with you some memories. And I'm hoping that the memories I share with you will trigger some of your own memories. 
Uh, we had a, a devotional with the staff this week on this issue, and it worked for the small group there. And even when I was sharing some of this with my wife, Leona, she said, yeah, that my mind started drifting, and I started thinking about my own memories. And so I'm here to say, it's okay if you drift. Let your mind wander. Let God just bring up memories for you about the importance of a home in your life. So I'm going to begin just by sharing with you my favorite memory as a kid. My favorite memory as a kid was being in the mountains of Colorado when we lived in Denver for a few years. And we would always go one uh, week a year up to the mountains. Uh, my whole family, my mom and dad and all six of us kids. Um, so the car was full. And we always came back um, on the weekend between, it was sometime between Christmas and, I mean, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we needed to get home. And so my dad would be driving down Pikes Peak Mountain, we usually went to Pikes Peak, he'd be driving down that at a breakneck speed. And if you've ever driven down a mountain road, you know what happens, people get a little nervous, and he didn't, he didn't even listen to my mom, she would just mutter, Fritz, slow down, slow down, but he just kept going because he knew the most important thing, other than keeping us safe, was to get us back home as a family because we had something to do. We had to go to our family room, which we had in our house, and we had to eat popcorn, heavily buttered, and we had to watch a movie. It was a mo The same movie was on every year. On that same evening, that same Sunday evening, at the same exact time, and we didn't have DVRs. So we had to get home in time to be able to watch what movie? Wizard of Oz. You got, yeah, Wizard of Oz. How many remember Wizard of Oz? All right. What line does Dorothy repeat often in the movie by clicking her heels together? What does she say? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. You know, I love that movie. I, I've always loved it. I'm still astounded. That in 39 and 40, the first color film, that it was, it was done so spectacularly well. But that line when she said that, that really anchored in some positive feelings about home in, in my life. There's no place like home. I believe that's so true. I mean, think about it. You go away for a few nights somewhere. Is it good to get home? <laughs> I mean, what beats? <laughs> I mean, it's great get away. But what beats getting close to home. Yeah, you're driving to your neighborhood. It's starting to look familiar. You start driving on your own street and everybody's looking, up, looking for the house. And then you, you see your home and your own front yard and your own front porch. And you drive into your own garage and you walk into your own kitchen with your own fridge and your own stove and your own coffee maker, right? And then you, 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 you use the bathroom, your own bathroom, your own tub, your own shower. And then you get to lie in your own bed. Nothing beats that, does it? I don't care how good a mattress you've been lying on the last three nights. When you get home, it's just home. There's no place like home. Not in my estimation. James Dobson, many of you know him um, as uh, he, was, he started a, a business called Focus on the Family. It's still going strong today. In fact, one of the people who worships here as often as he can when he's here, he just moved to Colorado Springs. He's like one of the executive directors of, of the whole program. And, but focus on the family. And I remember a series in the 70s that I went to at my church. It was called Home is Where the Heart Is. Any of you remember that? Home is Where the Heart Is. And I, I love that, that reference to home again, the importance of home. And, of course, it brought back all kinds of memories. I remember in high school when I played football. Whenever there'd be a few seconds left in the game, we're down by a few points, and we get to the red zone, and we just have like one down left. The most common phrase you'd hear in that offensive huddle was, let's bring it home. Let's bring it home, because that was equivalent, let's bring it to win it, right? We're going to make it a win. And songs, I mean, look at the songs today, as we saw the, the title for home come up a little earlier than expected, and then when it came up for the song, my first thought was, we're doing a Boublier song? Because he sings one on, on home. And then John Denver, how many of you remember John Denver's song called, Take Me Home? Hmm? Of course, his home was West Virginia, but it doesn't matter. 
It was a home to him. He, he, he loved it, right? And then my, my favorite, though, is Simon and Garfunkel's. I know this dates me, but you can listen. You're going to want to hear this. You really are. It's Homeward Bound. How, how many of you could sing that right now? I'll bet you could. Okay, we're going to try some. Home, where my thoughts escape in home, where my music's playing home, where my love lies waiting silently for me. Oh, give us a hand. That was so good. That was cool. Oh, I was so nervous to even try that. Thank you for joining in. I feel so much better. Now I know how Jen feels, right, up here trying to sing. Uh, anyway, I've always loved home wherever my home might be because that, that, that changes. We moved a lot as kids. How many of you have moved a lot? Moved to different homes or, or different states? How many of you have moved more than three times? Anybody here? How many have moved as many as ten times? Lots of army brats, and yeah, you know, that, 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 that happens, yeah. We moved a lot, too, as kids. My dad was a teacher, a, a principal, a musician, and, and so he'd get a call to this church or that church or this school or that school, and, and, and we'd move almost like every three years is about what it was, all over the country. His first call, his first call was in Houston, Texas. How many native Texans do we have here? That's right. We can all put that bumper sticker on our car, can't we? I'm a native Texan, born in Houston, Texas, yeah. Uh, three of the six kids were born there. I'm sorry for the other three. But you know, of all the things that I remember about Houston, which isn't a lot because I, I was young, what I don't remember is the humidity. My parents do. My parents do, but I don't remember. I just remember family and friends. That was my home until I was about five. And then my dad took another call. We moved to Watertown, Wisconsin. How many cheeseheads are here today? All right, Packers fans, same thing, right? Water, Watertown's a great, great town. It really, really is. I mean, I remember that. I love that. And so um, lots of memories when I had there. I had, a, my, I had about this many memories written down. I can only share a few. So it's, uh, I went to kindergarten there. I had my first girlfriend there, and that's where I first ate dirt. Okay, how many of you remember when you first ate dirt? I, come on, you know, it was my first and last time. Keith, you're looking like, like me, like, like I'm nuts or something. Come on, isn't everybody try it? All right. When I was seven, we moved again to Denver, Colorado. And uh, I remember making the decision to move to Denver, Colorado, because we sat around our picnic table indoors. Didn't have a lot of money, but we had a wooden picnic table in our kitchen. We all sat around, and my dad pretended to care what we, what we thought. <laughs> and, and he painted this beautiful picture of mountains, and, and he said, he says, oh, and Pike's Peak, and he showed us a picture of it, and in the atlas, and all this kind of where it is, and all that. He said, we can see that mountain right out our kitchen window, because they'd already gone up there and looked at houses, and we all said, yes, we're going, we're going. What he failed to tell us was the only way you could see it was through binoculars, but it didn't really matter, because it was such a beautiful place to go. That home that we lived in, we only rented there, but it was home. 1963 South Tennyson. I'll never, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that, that address. And we were there a couple of years after that, after that date, you know, 1963. But uh, that was a great, great home for me in Denver, Colorado. Especially, I liked the mountains and the trips up and down the hills, even at breakneck speeds. They were always for good memories. When I was 10, we moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. That's pretty much where I grew up. That's where I spent most of my, of my life. And I became an avid Minnesota Vikings fan, and I had been praying, praying many years, since I was 11 years old, really, for God to give us a Super Bowl win, and I'm here today to appeal for you to pray to. <laughs> I, 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 look, okay, th then just pray for a win next week when we play the Dallas Cowboys. Would you do that, please? Oh, a hostile crowd, a hostile crowd. Stephen, if you're listening, turn it off. You didn't hear that. <laughs> We're going to see the game, um, and it, it'll, be, it'll be a lot of fun. But um, at 33 years old, so I lived there from about 10 years old till 33 years old, I made my own move, my first move myself, and I moved to St. Louis, Missouri to become a pastor. What a campus that was in St. Louis, Missouri. If you've never been there, you need to go. Stone buildings looks like Cambridge in England. And just, just beautiful, beautiful. 70-acre tree campus. That's where I studied. That's where I spent three years. I studied there, did intramural sports there. Uh, I served a church there. That was my home. And then after my vicarage year and coming back there, I moved out to my first call in Southern California. Southern California was, was very, very interesting to me. 
Um, because that's where I learned the truth, that the mud does slide, and the hills do burn, and the earth does quake. Uh, it's, it's a trouble. They have different seasons there. Those are the seasons. And um, it's, uh, it's, I'll tell you what, some of my fondest memories are there. One is getting to know Leona and marrying her. So praise God for that. And then I got the call to come here to Central Texas. One of the things that excited me about coming here was because it was near Temple and the groves where my grandfather planted a church or was at a church. And my mom was raised in Temple, Texas uh, by her mom and his kids because my dad was a teacher. I always had those couple months off. We would come down for about two months. I even did the full third grade at Thornton Elementary School. And uh, we'd come down to Temple, Texas and spend time with, with Grandma. And man, I, 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 so coming back here, all kinds of memories came to mind I got to share with Leona. Uh, the first thing I showed her were cotton fields and how that all worked, you know, because I'd done some picking and being there. My, my grandma, grandparents had one. And pecan trees and homemade ice cream. This is where I learned uh, what a scorpion really was, all right, and how frightening tarantulas look. My mom played with them as kids. Um, it's also where I got kicked by a horse, and it's where I learned what hot in the summer really means, um, and that's, that's here. So what's happened is uh, I, I've made a circle, moving back to my roots, what I call my roots, back to what I now call home. So that's kind of the journey I wanted to go on. For I, I'm kind of curious if you had any memories get triggered for you, just maybe places you've been, homes that you've had. My question to you, and, and maybe you want to think about this and write this down on your, on your notes, um, what makes a home a home to you? What makes it special to you? What makes you think of it as Dorothy did when she clicked her heels and said, there's no place like home? What is that like? I'm curious. At our staff devotion that we had this, this last Tuesday, I asked that question of the staff there, and we all had different answers and, and, uh, and good ones. And, and then when it came to James Clem, our facilities manager, and for those of you who know him, you could see him saying this. He said, you know what? My wife is Filipino, and sometimes we thought about moving. Eventually, when I retire, move to the Philippines. He says, it really doesn't matter to me because um, um, wherever my wife and I are together is home. Isn't that cool? I think he read James Dobson's books on home is where the heart is because a real home is where our loved ones are. Now, with that in mind, I, I want to read about another home for us this morning. Um, this, uh, this is from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. And in what I'm going to read, this brief uh, few verses here, Jesus gives us a promise of a home. Now listen again to these words. If you heard them before, it's okay. It's right before he's crucified, and he's giving his disciples comfort. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many, some translations say rooms, this one says, mansions. I love that. It's a little more exciting. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and take you to be where I am. And then Thomas says to him, well, how do we know where that is? We don't know the way. And Jesus says his very famous words, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus makes the promise of heavenly home for his disciples. He's about to go to the cross, and he knows what they're going to face. I mean, they're going to be killed because of their faith in him as the Savior of the world. And he gave them this picture of the home for them. I think it's wonderful. It's hard to imagine, though. And so what I did was I picked another uh, brief reading here from the book of Revelation. In fact, chapter 21 is awesome because it describes the city of Jerusalem as the heavenly home. And, and I mean, it's, it's I, I, in my other Bibles, I haven't done it in this one yet, but I write down all the size of all the uh, uh, different measurements of the walls, the thickness, the height of them. And I'm going, that, that city is described in here. It will not fit, not only in Palestine, it won't fit anywhere in the Middle East. All right, in all the Middle East, it's that big, and, and the picture that God, he just gives us this picture because he wants us to imagine. That's what he's wanting us to do. And so I chose the next chapter, 22, because he gives us a more telescopic perspective of what our heavenly home is going to be, all right? He says this, 
John is saying, he says, he showed me a pure river of water of life. You know, good, good clean water is, is life, isn't it? Clear as crystal, and it proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb, who's Jesus. Now listen to this. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Where do we first hear about the tree of life? You've got to go back to the beginning of the Bible instead of looking at the end, and you read about the tree of life. It was in the garden. Another tree was there with the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they sinned because they were told not to. And what's so interesting about that is people tell me all the time, well, because this is kind of trying to, you know, figure out a way that the earth is, is like millions or billions of years old. They say, well, we don't know how long they were in the garden. I'm here to tell you, I don't think they were in there longer than three days because um, otherwise they'd have been sinning because one of the, their first commandment was be fruitful and multiply. And they didn't have any kids till they were out of the garden. But the other one was, is they didn't eat from the tree of life yet. Because had they ate from the tree of life, had they eaten from the tree of life, they'd have lived forever in their sin. Which is why, if you read the whole story, he kicks them out of the garden. Why? To protect them so they can receive the gift of an eternal life without sin. If he wouldn't have set the angel out there with the flaming sword to keep everybody away and keep us from seeing where it is, Adam and Eve, at the very least, would have taken from that tree of life and lived forever in their sin. Instead, God gave them the gift we call death. We call death. It's a gift from God because He wants us with Him. We couldn't be with Him if we had sin in our lives. So He says the tree of life is going to be right there. He goes on to talk about the people who were there in verse 4 of 22. says, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. How many of you had kids come up today for communion that I got to make the sign of the cross on their forehead? Huh? How many of you had? Why do I do that? Because we already have the name of Jesus on our foreheads in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's the Trinity. It's God himself. And it's reminding us that that carries us all the way to our eternal home. And I love the closing. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So there's, we aren't going to need any light because Jesus is going to be there. So I want to just say this. Even with all the pictures he gives us, it's really hard to imagine what heaven is. It's also, um, it doesn't surprise me that this book called Imagine Heaven is like a million bestseller book. It's from a local pastor, Pastor Burke from Gateway. Um, what he does is he takes near-death experiences from people, and he touches them against what God's Word says, and he found some very, very interesting things. I haven't read the whole book yet. But the organization that set off the whole 400 churches in Austin, the Explore God series, you remember that? Well, they're doing another series, I'd like to start the week after Easter, called What's After This? What's After This Life? You talk about a question everybody wants to know. And so um, I think we're going to have some fun too. But what I wanted to leave you with here is, is some, some teachings that God does tell us that aren't just left to our imagination about heaven. It's going to be a place that's filled with peace, a home that's filled with peace. No more suffering, no more tears as we sang about already. No more arguments about politics, right? And now some of you don't want to go, do you? <laughs> Just love that arguing about politics, I tell you. It's going to be a home of worship and service, giving thanks to God for all he's done and, and who he is. It's going to be a home where the lights are on all the time. There's no blackouts because Jesus is the light. It's going to be a home, guess what? We're going to have no questions. We always talk about, well, I'm going to wait till I get to heaven and ask God that question. Well, guess what? It tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, we only know in part now, but when we get to heaven, we're going to know it in full. And the last one I got here is that it's a home where our loved ones will be and a place where we will reunite. And tied into that one is we're going to know who our loved ones are. We're going to know who we are. That's a big fear of people. Do we have self-identification? Yeah, we do. And the people are going to know who we are. We're going to know who they are. And we are going to have the opportunity to be reunited in our home with our loved ones who've gone before us. Well, that's what's going to be. But what about now? That's the application. In the meantime, what do we do? We all have a home, right, right now, wherever it might be, whatever it might be like, it is our home. And, and, and God wants us while here to take care of that home and to treat that home as a home sweet home. That's what he wants from us. And the question we got to answer is how do we do that? And so I went to one other place in Scripture from the book of Joshua, 
Old Testament. And the Israelites, God's chosen people, he gave them land. He gave them home again and again and again. And they fought them. They listened to the people in those, in those uh, unbelieving cultures and started worshiping false gods. And so we have this part in the book of Joshua where it says the following, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Choose for yourself. It's choice. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, you get to choose. That is what we call the terrible power of free will. And it is. It's your choice. He goes on to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's nothing more important than to take care of those we love, especially eternally. And that begins in the home. That's why home is so, is so special. You know, Dorothy says there's no place like home, and I think God says she's right. And she was probably talking about the home in heaven. <laughs> Because when you look at the home in heaven, it's a home where you're going to have no worries, no cares, no anxiety, no debts, what we've been talking about for nine weeks, no credit card debts, no mortgage at all, not even an, not even an electric bill at all. Did you know that? And, and no debt for sin because Jesus took care of them all. And you don't get an electric bill because he's the light. See, he just, he just makes it so easy for us. Completely a debt-free home in which to live. Would you like that? It's coming, and it's already there for some of our loved ones who've moved on to it ahead of us. And today is a great day to think about this, to imagine the heavenly home, because today we give thanks to God for that home. It's not our home yet, but it is the home of our loved ones who knew what Jesus told his disciples in John 15. They knew that Jesus was the way and the truth and the life. Jesus was the way to that home. Today is what we call All Saints Day. I was talking to somebody earlier. They said, what's with all the lights? That's why the lights. We're celebrating All Saints Day. It's actually the day after Halloween. The Christian church, by the way, came up with the name Halloween for what we celebrate, Holy Eve. That's where it comes from. Because it's about a mystery. You see, in life, there's this mystery everybody's trying to figure out, solve. The mystery is the rising of the dead. And there's a couple ways that it gets celebrated. The first is on Halloween. It's defined as a mystery still needing to be unmasked, is what I would say. And so it's kind of dark and it's kind of scary. And, and in Halloween, we deal with that by pretending, that's what the folklore shows us to do, that loved ones are coming back, they're walking amongst us, you know, spirits. We see skeletons walking, serious. So we see all that. And where are they all headed, by the way? Where are they all headed? Home. In fact, you know why we have the jack-o'-lantern? You go back to the, to the days in Scotland when, when this was, was big among the Druids and all that. They would carve a turnip into the face of Uncle Bob. So he'd be pleased when he came where? Home. And so that's the idea behind Halloween. All Saints Day, the mystery isn't dark and, and it's not scary. Because its focus isn't on death, its focus is on life. And that's because we have had the mystery to us revealed in Jesus. That's the reality. Revealed in a Savior who died on that cross to forgive our sins. That's huge. A Savior who rose from that grave to, to let us be certain that just as he rose, so will we. We are his brothers and sisters. When we know him as Savior, we are connected to him, and we're going to get the same inheritance that he has. Eternal life in heaven forever. That's crazy, and it's all a gift through faith in Jesus Christ, which by itself is also a gift. So yes, our loved ones who've died and we who die will rise and be headed home. Only the, holy, the home where our loved ones are right now, um, it isn't the home they had here. They're not headed to that home. They're not going to come back like Uncle Bob to your front porch, right? No. They went to the home that God's prepared for them. That room or that mansion that we learn about in God's Word. 
We call this celebration today All Saints Day. It's a reminder that there's two kinds of people, really, in the eyes of God. There are those we call saints alone. Those are people who have died knowing Jesus, and now they can't eat from the tree of life because there's no sin. They are saints alone. Then you have the rest of us who are here today and online. <laughs> we are called sinner saints. We can't kid each other. We're all sinful human beings. But we are saints because we believe in Jesus Christ and we're covered by him to be holy in the eyes of God. That's important. And when we say in our Apostles' Creed, as I mentioned earlier, we say, I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. We are confessing the reality of this mystery that connects us across time and space to all people who today believe Jesus Christ is the way to heaven, and all people who have ever believed from the beginning of time, from the time of Adam and Eve to whenever Jesus comes back again, who believed in Jesus as Savior too, whether in the promise to come or the promise fulfilled. We get connected across time and space. Today we celebrate that connection, and we give thanks to God for home, the home here and the home yet to come. And today we remember, and I encourage you to, remember your loved ones who've died in Christ and now live with him in heaven and are home. But waiting as we are for us to be reunited with them because that's when it's really home. When we, as James Clem said, and as God reveals, that's what home really is when we are together once again with those we love. We give thanks to God today. We give thanks to him for the home that we have here. I pray you do that. No matter where you live, it's your home. But we also give thanks to him for the promise of the home we're going to be moving into next. You know what's interesting about that? We're never going to have to move again. How many of you are going to like that? And you can't take anything with you. So you don't have to haul any stuff. No, it's going to be the easiest move we ever make. That's cool. And today is a day set aside for us to especially remember and honor those loved ones who come to mind for you right now who've died and who knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. And how we'd like you to honor them is as you leave today, we have it set up in the back, light a candle in remembrance of them. Say thank you to God for them. I'm going to be leading the way on that, and as I usually do, I'm going to light a candle specifically on behalf of my father, because my dad, he provided the home that I had. He also lived a, an exemplary Christian life. He lived his faith, and, and I saw that. But most importantly, he knew the way to the heavenly home, and that's what he taught me and my brothers and sisters. And I thank God for that. So I'm going to take the lead as we leave this worship today and do that. And I encourage you to do the same. Light a candle on behalf of someone you love. Because the truth is, there's going to come that time when we will once again be together.